Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back. And uh, you know, when you got this many folks, it takes a while to give everybody a cup of coffee. But uh, anyway, for those of you out in television, if you ever care to come in for an afternoon of taping, it's usually, I say usually, the first Wednesday after a first Sunday, but we always like folk to check with us just in case there is a change. But uh, we have folks from in from all over the country to the today, so we appreciate that. All right, I'm going to get right back into the book, and uh, we were in First John chapter three, and uh, oh yeah, Iris is pointing at the blackboard, so that means this is the last two hours of book number fifty-six, and. Uh, It'll be ready for uh, mailing in about a what, month, six weeks, something like that. So anyway, uh, then uh, we'll just keep on going after we finish today. In 1 John, we'll be going on into uh, Jude and uh, at least part of Revelation. I don't know how much we'll uh, double up on. Okay. Now again, I guess I want to thank everybody for your constant prayers. You know, that's one thing we hear at all of our seminars. Everybody that goes by us says two things. I watch you every day. I pray for you every day. And uh, that's quite an encouragement. Okay, 1 John chapter 3. We got as far as verse 5, verse 6, right? Let's see, where are we? Yeah, we're in chapter 3, verse 5. You know that he was manifested. Now, you remember the word manifested in Scripture? The best way I can explain it is just put up in a spotlight. Uh, I always like to use the, the, uh, the microscope, the light under that slide. As soon as you turn it on, everything that's on that slide is what? Manifested. Just brought right into view. All right, so it applies even here. Christ came in His first advent. He was just literally put on the spotlight of all of human history to take away men's sins. Now, we never want to forget that He came first and foremost to the nation of Israel, but we'll be looking at that a little later. All right? And in Him, that is, in Jesus of Nazareth, was no sin. Now, verse 6, Consequently, whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. Now, that throws a curve at us, doesn't it? Because we certainly don't teach that we can reach a position of sinlessness. We all sin every day. But I'm going to be showing that now in these succeeding verses, that divine nature that comes in as a result of our salvation cannot sin. It's divine. And I'll show you how Paul deals with it as well. So don't let this throw a curve. Don't, don't strike out on this. But we're talking about the divine nature. Even for these Jewish believers, there had to be that born-again experience. Now, remember, John's Gospel, chapter 3, is where that term comes from, when God was dealing, or Jesus was dealing with who? Nicodemus. And what did he tell Nicodemus? Except ye be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So even the Jewish believers that we're dealing with here had to have that concept of a new birth. Now, it's amazing that Paul never uses the term born again. I guess you know that. But he certainly speaks of that new life as we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But he does not use the term born again. So we have to look at these Jewish believers as having an understanding of that new birth as a result of their believing that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. Now again, I know some of you have probably done this in the last day or two, looking forward to this. You go through 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and with the exception of one verse where he says that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin, there is not one reference to the cross. Not one. It is all based on who Jesus was so far as the Jews were concerned. All right, so keep that in mind, and then I'll go back uh, later on the program 
and show how this compares with what Paul teaches. All right, now remember, John is writing to Jewish believers who really know nothing of the gospel of grace. They are still under that kingdom economy, consequently this reference to the law and keeping the commandments and so forth. Now, the next verse, verse 7, is going to prove my point. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. What's the word? Doeth. What does that imply? Of his own volition. To that person who purposes in his heart to keep the commandments and to be a righteous man, he was righteous. And we can't do that. Paul never teaches us to do righteously. Now, let me show you what I mean. Come back to Romans chapter 3. See, and this is what we have to do with Scripture in order to keep it rightly divided is constantly be reminded of what is the situation for us in this age of grace compared to these Jewish believers who were still under the kingdom economy and will be again. They will be again as soon as the tribulation begins and they have permission to rebuild the temple, they'll go back under the gospel of the kingdom, which Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and to all the nations, and then shall the end come. Not this gospel of grace, the gospel of the kingdom. All right, so now in Romans chapter 3, look at the different language. John says, if you do righteously, you're righteous. Paul doesn't tell us that. How do we attain righteousness in this age of grace? By an imputation. Our righteousness is imputed to us. Not because we've worked for it, but because we what? We've believed it. It's faith. See? All right, start in verse 21 of Romans 3. Because this is what people are constantly mixing all up. No wonder there's confusion. Like I've got a book at home, the title of which, Why So Many Churches? And that's basically the reason. Because they mix everything up. One denomination takes this and throws it away, or they take this and bring it in, or vice versa. And consequently, you've got all these various concepts of what we're to do. But listen, if you keep Israel out of the church and the church out of Israel, hey, it's as plain as day. All right, here's a good example. Verse 21, but now, now remember, he's talking about the law up in verse 19 and 20. But now, on this side of the cross, with the law having been crucified with Christ, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, everything is on a building process. The law, the prophets, Christ's earthly ministry, and then the revelations of the mysteries to the Apostle Paul. It all comes in order, one resting on the other. All right, now verse 22, even the righteousness of God, God's righteousness, not ours, the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, that's the only way it can be extended from God to man is through Jesus Christ. And it's going to be upon all and unto all them that doeth righteously. No, it doesn't say that. That's what John said. Paul says, unto every one that what? Believes. See the difference? We don't become righteous by doing righteously. We become righteous by believing the finished work of the cross and let God impute His righteousness. Let Him do it. We can't. But when we have that imputed righteousness of God, it's going to affect our lifestyle. We're going to make a 180 degree turn and we see it letter after letter after letter, how their lives have been changed. That's what we look for. Okay, 
So now if you come back again to 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, he that committeth sin. Now remember, what did we determine in the last program? What's sin? Breaking the law. So he that breaks the law, or he that is a lawbreaker, is of the devil. For the devil sinneth, or has been a lawbreaker, from the beginning. He's never been anything but. For this purpose, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, never lose sight of the fact. This was the heart of salvation to these Jews under the gospel of the kingdom, that they were to recognize and know and believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. Now let's go back and pick up a, a clear scriptural account of this. Go back to Peter's confession. Matthew chapter 16. Now this is Peter. I call this Peter's profession of faith. And this was the heart of the gospel of the kingdom. Who Jesus of Nazareth really was. He wasn't just a prophet. He was the Son of God. The creator of the universe. And Peter recognized it. All right, Matthew chapter 16. Oh, we always have to start at verse 13 in order to make sense for new listeners. For those of you who have heard it a hundred times, bear with me one more time. Matthew 16, verse 13, they're at the end of the three years of earthly ministry. They're about to go up to Jerusalem for the Passover and the crucifixion. And so when Jesus came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, the twelve. Now I'm saying twelve because Judas is still with him. So he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now there it is. That's all they were to really know and believe, who he was. Now after three years of signs and wonders and miracles, how much did the average Jew on the street know? Nothing. Look at their answer. Now, this is shocking. After three years of nothing but miracles and signs and wonders, and I hope you all know that there were far, far more than what are recorded. The last verse of the book of John says that if they'd been recorded, the world wouldn't be able to hold it. And yet, after all of those miracles, look what the response is. Verse 14. And the twelve answered, well, some say you're John the Baptist. One of the other twelve probably said, well, I've heard some say you're Elijah. One of the others probably came up and said, no, he said, I've heard people say they think he's John the Baptist. Others said, Jeremiah. Still others said, oh, he's one of the prophets. Imagine. Imagine. Now, these Jews have been steeped in the Scriptures, they thought, like a lot of people today, you know, they think they know their Bible and then they finally realize how little they know. Well, these guys are no different. And here they've been with the Lord for three years, miracle after miracle after miracle. Now verse 15. Now he puts the question again. Whom do you say that I am? Have you done any better than the rank and file of Israel? Whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, as usual, was the spokesman. And so he answers on behalf of at least ten of them, maybe not Judas. But Simon Peter answered and said, Now watch this. My, if you haven't highlighted it before, do it now. This was Peter's confession. Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, can you make it any plainer than that? 
That's who he was. He was the Son of God. Now, you want to remember that most of our cults who claim to be Christian, that's the first sign of a cult. They deny that Jesus is God. And they'll use every imaginable detour that you can throw at them to deny it. I've tried it. There's only one verse so far I've found that kind of makes them stutter and stammer, and that's Titus. Let's go back and look at it a minute. Come back to Titus. Chapter 2. Should be verse 13, if I'm not mistaken. Titus, chapter 2. Verse 13, now for these folks that come to your door, without my naming them, you know who they are, and they are the most adamant that Jesus Christ was not God. Well, just let them read this verse and then see what kind of a stammering excuse you get. Oh, they'll have one, but it won't be valid because this is what the book says. We are to be looking, verse 13, we're to be looking for that blessed hope. Now, this is Paul. The blessed hope. The rapture, as we call it, not the second coming, the rapture. We're to be looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God, who? Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, can you make it any plainer than that? How in the world can anybody twist that out of shape to accept the fact that he wasn't God? Our Savior, the great God, Jesus Christ. All right, now, for the Jew under the gospel of the kingdom, then, that was what they were to understand, who he was. He was the anointed Messiah of Israel, but he wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a good person. He wasn't anything but the Son of God. Now, of course, Paul comes along a little further in Coloss or, yeah, Colossians, and Paul makes it so plain that he was also what? The creator of everything. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the creator of everything. And if he was any less than that, he couldn't have bought our salvation. He couldn't have paid for it, but he was, and he did. Okay, now let's come back to John again. We make a little headway. I thought I'd cover all of John and 2nd John and 3rd John today, but I don't think we'll make it, honey. She wanted me to get it all in book 56. See, but I don't think I'm going to make that. Okay, chapter 3 again. Verse 8, for this purpose, to take away men's sin, to defeat the father of lies, the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God. Oh, don't lose that. He was the Son of God. Now, that doesn't mean that God was the sire and he was the offspring. We have to recognize that these are terminologies that God has seen fit to use for his own purposes to delineate the three persons of the Godhead. It does not mean that God the Father sired God the Son and then the Holy Spirit was just some other addendum. No, they are just simply titles of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and they are all co-equal in the Godhead. One is just as much God as the other. And uh, now verse comes to mind. Come back, honey. Sorry about this. Come back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Somebody just asked me at break if I lay awake half the night, and I says, ah, not so much for these tapings anymore as I, as I do the all-day seminars, and then I get up at the seminar and I don't use a single verse that I thought about at night. So I try to quit that too. But here we are, Colossians chapter 2. And again, I guess I better take you back to verse 8, hon. Verse 8, Colossians 2. I don't want to go too fast, but you can keep up with me. Colossians chapter 2, 
Verse 8, Paul writing to the Gentiles now, remember, what a big difference. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, or again, this world system, <clears throat> and not after Christ. For in Him, who? Christ, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead how? Bodily. Now, let's just show you what he's talking about. Come back to John 14. I trust you all know these verses, but again, we never know. John 14. Verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> John 14. Verses 8 and 9. Now, this should answer all your questions, shouldn't it? Here they are, just shortly before he's going to be taken to be crucified. They're in the upper room. And Philip, verse 8, said, And Lord, show us the Father. Let us get a glimpse of the Father. And it sufficeth us. That's all we need. Now look, Jesus answered, Have I been so long time with you? Three years now, remember. And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Plain as English can make it, isn't it? So who was he? Well, he was the manifestation of the whole triune Godhead. Now come back to Colossians again and put the frosting on the cake. Back to Colossians 2, just to repeat. After Jesus tells Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now Paul can come back by Holy Spirit inspiration and tell us in Colossians 2, verse 9, for in him, that is in Christ, in God the Son, dwelleth all the fullness of the whole Godhead. How many persons in the Godhead? Three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're all manifested in the Son. And yet they maintain their individuality as their role demands. Now, we can't comprehend that. I can't. That's beyond human understanding. But isn't most of it? My, what little we get is minute, like we were just talking yesterday. When we get to glory and we get full knowledge, now I don't know if it's going to work this way or not, but we'll look back at this feeble existence and we'll think, why, we didn't know anything. See? There is so much that we can't comprehend. You've heard me say it over and over, especially in my weekly classes. There is not a human, I don't think, has ever lived that can fully understand all that Christ accomplished at the cross of Calvary. There's no way we can understand that. How he took the sins of the world on himself, how he defeated Satan and all the powers of his realm and domain, we can't comprehend it. So what little we understand, we take by faith. And it's the same way with the triune God. I can't comprehend it, but I believe it. No questions asked because the book says it, see? All right, come back to 1 John chapter 3. So verse 8 again. For this purpose, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, was manifested, was brought into the human experience and made, like I said, in the spotlight of all of human history, that he might destroy or bring to nothing the works of the devil. And of course, he did that at the resurrection. That's when he was defeated. 
Now verse 9. Here's another one of those verses that are hard for us to comprehend until you understand what he's really saying. Whosoever is born of God. In other words, whoever has that eternal life by virtue of their believing, whoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Have you ever found a believer that didn't sin? Oh, I've run across a few who tried to tell me they didn't. <laughs> but they lie through their teeth because we all sin. You cannot be otherwise. So what does this mean that he is born of God doth not commit sin? That divine nature within us that comes as a result of salvation, whether it was the Jewish economy or ours, that's pretty much the same. The divine part of us cannot sin. So why do we sin? Because the other part takes over. Now, let me take back. Only got a minute left. Let's come back quickly to Galatians, honey. I may not have time, so we may have to pick this up in the next half hour. But here is the dilemma, how that if the divine nature cannot sin, then why do we sin? It's that old nature that's still with us. Galatians 5, verse 17. Galatians 5, verse 17. Okay, we're going to get this on the screen yet, I hope. For the flesh, the old sin nature, warreth or lusteth against the spirit, the new nature, and the spirit against the flesh. See, one against the other. And these are contrary. Well, they're opposites. Of course they're contrary. They are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Well, what's the Scripture telling us? Hey, we've got a royal battle going on constantly. The sin nature says, do it. The new nature says, I can't. And the old nature says, everybody else is. The new nature says, no, they aren't. And so it's this constant battle, and then the next verse says it. So if you're led of the Spirit, if you're under control of that new divine nature that does not sin, then you see you have escaped the demands and the condemnation of the law. It's just that simple, see? And so here's where the crux of the matter is, that we have a divine nature and we still have the old sin nature. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.